Hello everybody, welcome back to Janice Loki. I'm your host Tuyan Arturk. I'm a Vienna-based architect working in a design agency where I create experiences in the built environment through the exhibition and information design. Today I will talk about Villa Savoy, a signature building from Le Corbusier, where you can see his fingerprints all over the place. Le Corbusier was an architect, but he was also a writer and painter. So I want you to keep that in mind while looking at this building. I will divide this video into three parts. We will have a quick look into the facts and explanation of the five points of the new architecture. In the second part, we will dive into the plans and analyze them. In the third part, I will talk about my point of view on the building. So let's get into it. In 1928, the Savoy family wanted to have a summer house, so they commissioned Le Corbusier to design the villa. It was completed in 1930, but villa leaked water and needed repairs even after the completion. So they waited another year to move until the necessary adjustments were made. It is located on the outskirts of Paris. Like much modern architecture, the villa used the advantage of reinforced concrete. Le Corbusier designed the house with his cousin and they owned an architecture office in Switzerland. Because Le Corbusier had already a name and a right architectural style, it is possible to see all five points of the new architecture in this building. The initial brief from the family was relatively short. An extra room, a place to park the cars, a place for the caregivers and a terrace. Le Corbusier was extremely free with the design of this building. The only limitation was his own rules and architectural aesthetics. So Le Corbusier created his own set of architectural rules during his career. He published these rules in 1927 on the magazine he founded together with his friends in 1920. The first point of the new architecture is Plotis. The grid of columns replaces the load-bearing walls and brings openness and a contemporary aesthetic to the ground floor. In this scenario, the ground floor becomes a space for circulation for the vehicles and to people. This design method is still used to promote accessible areas and creates a connection between the public space and the building. The second point is called the free design of the ground plan. It is achieved by freeing the walls from the structural constraints so that the partitions inside the building can be placed freely and become more flexible. This feature allows for future adaptation of the building into different scenarios. For instance, when your family expands with a newborn, you can freely add and move the partitions to adapt the house to your current needs. The third point is called free design of the facade. Separating the structure from the walls not just generates an open plan, but also a facade that allows flexibility in their design. This way, the architect can design the facade without any constraints from the structure. The fourth point is the horizontal windows. Thanks to the free facade, we can now add horizontal windows to create generous amounts of opening that cuts through the whole length of the building. This feature provides more indoor lighting and panoramic views of the exterior than the traditional windows. The fifth and the last point is the roof gardens. It's a flat roof system with intensive or extensive gardening, which provides additional living space. And the argument for that was, the house should provide the space that it takes from the nature back. Especially in the previous decades, roof gardens have become very popular. The improvements in materials and waterproofing solutions allowed for even more freedom using this architectural design method. Now that we have a general idea of the rules guiding this architectural piece, let's look at the plans to find many perks implemented by the architect. The ground level was designed especially approached by the car. Once you drive into garden, you will be welcomed by the north faced facade of the building before entering the Plotis. The car then curves to the left, unlocking the glazed entrance to the house. The house entrance appears on the dark northern side, opposite to the main approach. Many people believe that Le Corbusier wanted to build 
curiosity and invoke a special experience by moving through the differentiated areas. Afterwards, you can park the car in the parking area or drive further. And one of the photos in the book is titled as The Car Returns Back to Paris, which I find pretty cute. The entrance door positioned on the pilotis grid. Disturbs the structure and elevates the importance of the door. The structural grid in the exterior is uniform and even creates the illusion that it goes through the building. But when you go inside, the grid of plotis decreases. Closely positioned columns raise the importance of the entrance even more and play with the user's sense of special understanding. The left side of the ramp is perfectly aligned in the middle of the entrance door, guiding the user towards the ramp. However, the stairs are placed far away from the entrance, discouraging immediate usage for the user. I believe this was the first time that ramp was introduced to a domestic building, which also attached some industrial characteristics like turning the house into a machine. Architects' favorite white floor tiles are placed diagonally to promote movement across the circulation area. The rooms for caregivers are placed far behind the entrance and the doors are kept away from the body of the whole space. Once we go upstairs, the living room door welcomes us at the top of the ramp. Unlike any other door in the building, this one is glazed giving a glimpse of what we will experience once we go inside. The kitchen is placed right next to it, directly connect to the living room. Bedroom walls in the corridor are painted in dark colors like dark blue and brown, causing them to camouflage into the background. For example, the door to the master bedroom is painted brown and guarded by the column and spiral stairs to provide privacy. The tiles in the circulation area are still diagonal until we step into the functional areas like the kitchen, bathrooms and terrace. Le Corbusier used this technique to communicate with the user. Slow down, this is a space to stay and explore. The terrace door is placed on the left of the ramp. And once we step into the terrace, we see three strategically placed elements. Two plant pots and a table divide the terrace into three areas. The first area connects itself to the living room, the second area binds both spaces, and the third area is a semi-open space with a roof that directly connects to the bedroom. Placing a roof on the part of the terrace changes its spatial qualities and increases the user's awareness. Once again, the floor slabs take the diagonal form on the ramp, like in all circulation areas throughout the house. The roof terrace is called solarium, to celebrate the health-giving benefits of the sun and air. The ramp opens in the middle of the plan and divides the terrace into two parts. We again see carefully placed plant pots to stop the user move carelessly. Le Corbusier wants you to be aware of the space and where you are going. A southwest wall protects the terrace from the wind. I hope you get some interesting information about Villa Savoy. I would say it is the Pantheon of Le Corbusier. He smoothened his architecture rules up to the highest point with this project. It is pretty fun to unveil the secrets in the design of the house and obviously there are so many other perks that I didn't cover in this video. There is one thing that I dislike about the five points of the new architecture and it is the horizontal windows. I am personally not very fond of it and let me tell you why. I think they don't bring the necessary warmth to a living space. The energy it brings is very machine-like and the experience using them varies from person to person depending on your height. For example, I am 119 meters, which roughly makes 6.2 feet, and my eye level is usually not in the middle of the opening, but above close to the wall joint. 
and I find it personally very disturbing. It would totally make sense in an office building where you try to pump as much light as possible for the people who are sitting far away from the windows. But in a domestic building, I'm not really convinced. Thank you for staying till the end. Let me know your thoughts about the horizontal windows in the chat down below. Did you have the similar experience as I did or do you completely disagree? I also want to show you guys the two books that I read. One of them is uh, The Big Boy, Le Corbusier Le Grand. And I highly recommend this book. It is like an encyclopedia of Le Corbusier. Uh, there is not much written in the book, but you can find lots of uh, photos, sketches, drawings, paintings, and architectural projects of Le Corbusier. And the second book would be The Le Corbusier and the Architectural Promenade from Flora Samuel, this one. And it's only uh, his architectural works uh, included in the book. And you can find lots of uh, text and explanation of the houses. And I really like these two books. I would recommend you to take a look if you are interested to know more about Villa Savoy. If you like this video, don't forget to share with somebody you might think will be interested. I believe sharing and expanding knowledge is the best thing that we can do to make a better world. Have a glorious day and see you in the next video. Cheers!